Welcome to The Money GPS. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. There was so much going on in the previous video that I had to split it up. There's just a lot of depth that I need to get into. So what I want to talk about here is digging deep into what we're seeing. What's happening with Russia? Who are the biggest losers right now? Who are the biggest winners right now? A lot of charts and data to get into here and also the next thing i want to look at is the major moves geopolitically i want to show you india i want to look at what's happening here on another level altogether let's begin taking a look at the 37 billion dollar u.s bond fund emerging as the biggest loser from russia so here you can see that this particular fund had a lot of exposure to russia and it certainly took a beating okay down more than eight percent this year and more than three percent since the conflict began the losses spurred by investments in russian securities have given the fund an unwanted distinction it's one of the worst performing funds in the category so this happens all the time and what the reason i mentioned this year is that when you have you know they might have said Oh, now is the time to get into Russia because you've got oil prices rising. So therefore, it, extra exposure to Russia is a good thing, okay, that they're undervalued and this and that. But, you know, that could be part of your portfolio. But if you didn't diversify and you just thought now is the time to go all in on it, you can be crushed. And some people, they're putting their money into different equities, Russian equities, not knowing if they're going to be able to take their money out. What happens, right? What could happen here? We don't know. And that's the concern. That's why always having a different level of diversification than what they tell you, you know, diversify, 60-40 split. There's much more to diversification than that. Here's how oil's historic surge is impacting Asia's stock markets. There's a lot of charts in here, and I believe the next one that I want to show you. Stocks in India and South Korea have been strong, have seen strong equity outflows. Net commodity exporters like Australia emerge as beneficiaries. My friends in Australia, that's good news because you want to see that. You want to see the development. You want to see the encouragement of stuff to move out, to be used, to be consumed. This is good for the economy. It creates jobs. We want to see that, okay? As long as nobody's being hurt by it, we want to see that growth and the potential. The historic surge in oil is reshaping the outlook for Asian equity and currency markets as the specter of a prolonged high prices exposes the vulnerability of energy-dependent countries so it also you you find that times you know when oil is down at zero or in the negative a, as it was if a country is extremely reliant on it they're going to be hit hard by that that's why you want to have many different things okay if you got oil but i mean do you have tourism do you have you know development do you got some sort of you know, services you want that you definitely want that that's why if you look at what happened in 2020 all these different islands in the Caribbean, you know, so many of them were just crushed, absolutely crushed because they have tourism, okay? And maybe they have, you know, they can export some commodities, maybe it's, you know, bananas, okay? But how much of that can they really do? Obviously not much. A lot of these islands are tiny and they don't produce enough food for themselves in many cases. So what happens here? They just have to deal with it, and that's not good. You have a lot of people just leaving. A lot of people left a lot of those islands. Maybe they're coming back now, but that's not good. It shows you that you need diversification as a country. A few resource-rich nations like Australia and Indonesia are among the beneficiaries as their markets are holding up amid the downturn since Russia invaded Ukraine. Sanctions against Ukraine, oil pushed uh, up to as high as Brent, Brent up to as high as 139. Okay, you know that already. So here you're just seeing this. Here there was uh, things like talking about Australia, and you can see the absolute beneficiary of this. Oil and natural gas account for more than 15% of Australia's export earnings. Very good to see that around this time. That's for sure for people in Australia. It could push the prices of other things up um, just because it's, 
in a situation where it's, hey, things are attractive, maybe they got more people and businesses moving in, more demand, right? Okay, so it just talks about more of this showing you Asia's oil dependence share of oil imports as a percentage of the total at the top, India, and then South Korea. So you could see how they're hit, hurt differently than some of these other countries. China, 10, 10 on the list. Okay, so it's much, much lower. Australia, 10 as well. Okay, India imports about 85% of its oil needs Foreigners are selling stocks at a record pace, and the exodus has sent the rupee to a record low. So there is more than that, but I just love the, to see this, all this stuff in here, um, you know, global perspective. Global perspective, that's what this channel is about. I do have a heavy focus, obviously, on the U.S. That's where most of my subscribers are. But you got to look at this globally and understand how all the puzzle pieces come together. Sell-off intensifies. Global funds have rushed to sell Asian emerging market stocks in recent weeks. Uh, and I mean, there's so many things that they've been selling off. Bonds, bonds have been selling off incredibly at this time as well. Depends on where you look, of course. Stock market bottom slipping away after 13 years of dip buying. What has happened over this period? Stock markets fall, investors rush to buy the dip. Stock markets fall, investors rush to buy the dip. Every time. There hasn't really been any dips, actually, since 2009. It's just been a straight line upward, except for that one in March 2020. That would be the only one that really classifies as a dip, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I believe it gets into it in this article here, but if it doesn't, I just want to quickly mention the fact that there's all the data is there provided by the EPFR that tells you that retail investors, specifically the retail investors, have been rushing in to buy stocks like never before. 13 years since stocks hit their financial crisis bottom and two years out of the capitulation, equity bulls are again hoping that March will be the month when spiraling markets finds its floor. Their faith is being severely tested. I don't think now is personally the right time to be getting into just just throwing your money into the markets like heavily. Um, some people might start dipping their toe in. And that's certainly, um, I think, a more wise decision just because there's just way too much uncertainty. It's when we find certainty and a somewhat of a foundation that we get to go in. And you might not be predicting. There's no way to predict the bottom. You're not going to get the bottom. But ultimately, you can kind of, you know, realize that you know the, i think the worst is past us maybe you know it could still go down but the worst is like you want to be in that zone better to be slightly on your way up than still going down right impossible to predict anyway stocks sell off u.s equities retreated for a second straight week you can see the data just pulling up look at any market this is the three broad indexes but look at any market and what's been happening it's been so weak there's been very little liquidity right now and i've personally talked to extremely sex uh, an extremely successful person um last week i think it was and he's got a lot of money in the markets um and he was telling me about the people who have way more money than him, very successful people as well, saying that they've got a like crazy amount of cash just sitting and waiting. And they're they haven't put that money to work yet. They they, they have money in the markets, but all, all that cash that they have is simply sitting and waiting. What does that tell you? That people with a lot of money tend to be very patient. Patience is a virtue. This is just showing us here, EPFR, they're, you know, like I said, money is moving in right now from the retail side, from the retail side, okay? And then it just gets into, you know, more of this. All of, of what I wanted to show you is that during the time in which we have 10% drops, Statistically, a 10% drop is an opportunity to buy it. That's statistics. That's a known fact. Is now the right time to buy in? You have to make that decision for yourself. Yeah, I can't tell you. 
But I can tell you right now that there's still a lot of uncertainty, particularly, I mean, you got the Fed this week. you got major options expiry happening. You've got, on top of that, what's happening with Russia. Is it going to escalate further? There's so many unknowns. And a lot of that could develop in this week. So is it better to buy in now or to simply wait a few days to kind of see? Are we going to have firm footing? Are we going to get the expectations for the Federal Reserve? Is that what's happening? Or is it going to be something completely we weren't even expecting? History tells us the more capitulation we see in the measures, the greater the potential for upside markets, given the fast pace of the development and continued reduction in hedge fund positions this week, we will monitor the measures closely. They want to see what's happening, see where the money is going to, see what's happening with the Federal Reserve and so on. Okay, take a look at this here. Positioning has declined, but not to typical trough levels. So this is a sentiment indicator from Goldman Sachs, basically saying that if we're at the bottom, we're going to see this indicator get much lower. It's not there yet. On the right-hand side, equity market liquidity has deteriorated, something I've shown you and talked about on numerous occasions. Quickly, my friends, we need to look at this, okay? There's so much, so much data didn't even get a chance to get into. But look at this really quickly. This article here is talking about the bilateral trade between Russia and India. Rupee ruble trade, as the name suggests, is a settlement arrangement where a Russian bank keeps enough INR deposits to pay off the Indian exporters to Russia in INR. Correspondingly, on the flip side, an Indian bank keeps enough ruble deposits in Russia to pay for Indian imports. This makes dependence on the U.S. dollar unnecessary. And this is not the only case where this kind of thing has happened. This, this does happen. It's a little more difficult, in particular these, because, as they say here, they're not hard currencies, i.e. freely floating on the international currency markets. But they're doing it. They want to do this more. They want this to happen. We've even seen limited trade previously, gold for oil, and this kind of thing that's happened between countries. Um, but it's not like the big money. So I'm interested to see if they start moving away from the U.S. dollar longer term, longer term, okay? Not just India, Russia, China as well, and other countries. Commodities firms continue trading in Russian oil and gas. And this is the thing, like you get a lot of this, you know, headlines, Coca-Cola is moving out, McDonald's is moving out. But let's be clear, these companies, big, big companies, you can see Trafigura, Baital, Glencore have all loaded cargoes of oil products onto tankers in Russian ports this week. So despite the chaos and, and obviously everything that's happening, these commodity traders have come under less scrutiny over their ties with Russian with Russia than the other major oil majors and have not made any commitments to stop buying Russian oil. So some of the companies are saying, we're just going to keep doing business. Okay? We got to do this. And it's going to happen. And I do think, ultimately, there's a huge risk of just simply cutting off something. Cutting off the gas to Europe. Cutting off the oil from Russia. What happens if there's a problem with the pipelines that go through Ukraine? I mean, there's so many risks involved right now with what we're seeing. I hope that we will see resolution to all of this and that, you know, we can go back to normal, if that's what you want to call it. You know, there's nobody ever wins in war. Regular people. I've seen it time and time again. You can read Smedley Butler's book. Um, it's like more like a pamphlet, I guess. It's, it's a tiny book. Uh, war is a racket. And... Um, I think everybody should read that. I know some of you have, and I've seen the comments before. But I guess that's all. If you appreciate the information, hit that thumbs up. That's all you got to do to support the channel. Hit the thumbs up. If you're not already, you've got to subscribe. And I'll see you on the next one. Take care.